Labadiena, and good afternoon to my dear colleagues at the Lithuanian City of London Club and to everyone else who is listening to the today's podcast. I hope that you and your families are safe and well and have managed to avoid this terrible virus. I'm delighted to assist the members and the alumni of the LCLC and I'm grateful to Laurinas and the board for their encouragement and support preparing this podcast. In light of unavoidable disruptions to the market as a result of COVID-19, many businesses are not in a position to comply with their contractual obligations, which has wide-ranging effects on other businesses and individuals. Therefore, the topic for our presentations today will be what are or will be the effects of COVID-19. As many of you know, my name is Rosita or otherwise Rosie Goncar in my professional capacity. For the last seven years, I've been working as a solicitor for the international law firm Hill Dickinson LLP. I'm based in the London office, but Hill Dickinson also has further offices in the UK and also international offices in Monaco, Singapore, Hong Kong and Greece. I work in the marine trade and energy team, where we deal with a wide variety of disputes in relation to sale of goods, energy and transport which includes road, sea and air transportation. I deal with contentious issues, which means that my clients call me only when the things go wrong and when they want me to solve their problems. I then assist the parties to resolve their disputes at English courts or arbitration tribunals. However, our firm also deals with a wide range of non-contentious commercial matters and assist our clients with regard to employment and healthcare issues, corporate commercial, property, restructuring deals and transactions. After receiving your questions, I have invited my colleagues to contribute to this presentation and I hope that you will find their presentations useful for your personal or business needs. I will begin today's podcast with a short introduction of the concepts of force majeure and frustration in the English law and Lithuanian law. In the current circumstances, most businesses find themselves with difficulties, be those financial or operational, of performing their contractual obligations with one or several parties. A good contract will prescribe for force majeure events and have a long list of circumstances or events which can entitle a struggling, non-performing party to rely upon such a clause to claim relief under the contract terms. This would be the case for several circumstances constituting a force majeure or leading to a right of frustration under the contract as a result or effect of COVID-19 world pandemic, where one or both parties sometimes are unable to fulfill their obligations. I will now give a comparison of these two doctrines under English law and Lithuanian law and how that may affect some of your existing contractual arrangements in the current pandemic, depending upon the governing law referred to in these contracts. Under English law, force majeure cannot be relied upon without a clause in the contract which clearly articulates the circumstances under which it operates. It means that a right to terminate due to a force majeure event has to be expressly stated in the party's contract. As a consequence, in the absence of such a clause, a party cannot rely on an otherwise straightforward defense to breach of contract where they are faced with a force majeure type event. This is a major difference between the English law and many other continental law systems, including Lithuanian law. Section 6.212 of the Lithuanian Civil Code expressly grants a party a right to terminate the contract if the conditions for force majeure are satisfied. In any event, force majeure can rarely be an easy remedy and I understand that the courts both in the UK and in Lithuania are not rushing to relieve the parties from their contractual obligations. Therefore, If your contract is subject to English law, but it does not contain a force majeure clause, the English law allows the party allegedly in breach of contract, 
seek to rely on the doctrine of frustration to justify its non-performance. The doctrine of frustration has some similarities with section 6.212 of the Lithuanian Civil Code. The starting position is that the doctrine of frustration operates on a much wider scale than a typical force majeure clause would. The test, therefore, has four broad requirements. First, an interrupting event occurs. Second, the interrupting event was outside of the reasonable contemplation of the parties. Third, this event substantially changes the nature of the contract. Four, it would be unjust to keep the parties bound in the circumstances. Threshold for frustration is very high. A contract will not be frustrated just because the performance of a contract would be commercially unprofitable. It means if it gets more expensive for one party to perform. Consequently, where options are available to the other party, that party may simply be forced to take the financial hit and has no right to terminate the contract. I will now give the floor to my colleagues from Hill Dickinson Corporate Commercial Employment and Restructuring Teams, and I will speak to you again at the end of the presentations. All right, everyone, uh, pleasure to be um, speaking with you. Very, very brief introduction. Um, I'm Mark Cranshaw. I'm an associate from Hill Dickinson's employment team, and I'm going to take us through some of the impacts which COVID-19 has had on the employment and HR world, and hopefully provide um, a few answers to some questions which have kindly been submitted by some of our listeners ahead of this recording. Just before I start, I think it's really, really important to note the date which this is being recorded. And that is uh, Friday, the 5th of June, 2020, on a uh, quite rainy and miserable morning. The reason for this is because those working in the employment sphere have probably never experienced such vast developing and dynamic circumstances since the virus outbreak. There have been numerous pieces of legislation, statutory instruments, directions and guidance notes for us all to consider, including around seven or eight updates to versions of guidance on furlough and the corona jo coronavirus job retention scheme alone. I think it's safe to say that everyone's kind of now familiar with the concept of what furlough is, but it was brand new in the UK before March of this year. And given the timing of this session, I thought it would be a good idea um, for me to discuss and highlight some of the key takeaways of how uh, the CJRS is going to evolve over the next few months and some of the key takeaways um, of the Chancellor's announcement last Friday on the 29th of May 2020. Now, I should note that further guidance is due to be published um, on the 12th of June 2020, but the key dates and information that we need to be aware of are hopefully set out on the slide accompanying this recording. Very briefly, the CJRS is going to close to new entrants on the 1st of July 2020. Um, and anyone as of that date should have previously been furloughed under the existing scheme as it is in place at this moment of time, which requires individuals to be on a period of furlough for a minimum of three weeks. So this essentially means that anyone who has not been on, on a period of furlough leave previously and has not been claimed for under the CJRS previously needs to be on furlough leave by the 10th of June 2020. So time is running out. As of the 1st of July 2020, the principle of part-time working and part-time furlough is going to be permitted. And we understand there's going to be no minimum period of furlough from the 1st of July, meaning employees and employers are free to agree working and furloughing arrangements accordingly. There's going to be a series of stepped increases in the minimum amounts uh, that the employers must contribute in relation to the scheme. And this is going to be started on the 1st of August 2020, and it's going to be increasing monthly until the scheme closes on the 31st of October 2020. I'm not going to run you through all the contribution levels and all of those kind of things because they are set out on the on the slide. 
Another area which I just very briefly wanted to highlight and comment on is um, is these rules around and surrounding quarantine. Now, the first thing I should say is that the Foreign Commonwealth Office, um, uh, you know, the, the advice which, which is coming out of the Foreign, Foreign Commonwealth Office is that British nationals, and I understand it's the same in Lithuania as well, are still advised against all but essential international travel. In the UK, as of Monday the 8th of June next week, anyone, with a, a few exceptions, entering or returning to the UK is required to, acquar- to, to quarantine or isolate themselves for a 14-day period. The quarantine is going to be enforced by, uh, by way of fines, um, fines for non-compliance, and as matters currently stand, self-isolation due to overseas travel does not trigger SSP, which is the sick pay uh, regime in the UK. Um, so there's no SSP entitlement and therefore subject to how contracts and policies are worded and how individual employment relations operate, there's no entitlement to payment if you are required to quarantine. So what this means is for anyone who's booked to travel or will travel to the UK uh, next week, notwithstanding issues that they may may find in relation to travel insurance in view of the Foreign Commonwealth Office's advice, um, you will be required to quarantine and this this could cause issue in relation to your employment and and attendance at work. So you you, you should seek clarification from employers as to what the implications might be um, and particularly if you're unable um, to work from home. Now, I think it's fair to say that uh, COVID-19 has completely changed the landscape and the way that many businesses operate, particularly professional services. Uh, And working from home has become somewhat natural and normal. Those businesses who are bringing people back from furlough and bringing them back into a workplace, there are a number of uh, issues for consideration. Uh, First up, I think it should be highlighted that the decision as to who to furlough, who not to furlough, who to ask to come back into the workplace should all be made with ordinary principles of employment and in particular discrimination um, in mind. Also, um, employers um, not have not only a, a statutory duty to ensure a safe working environment if they are opening up um, operations again, but also um, employers should be aware that there, there is also a statutory obligation to consult with um, in, in relation to health and safety issues. Now, this consultation should be done either directly with employees or with health and safety representatives, or with trade unions, depending on the circumstances. And failure to uh, to either ensure a safe working environment or to consult on the health and safety measures potentially exposes organisations to health and safety detriment or dismissal claims, and also health and safety related whistleblowing. So just a couple of points for consideration and uh, some food for thought there in relation to those returning to a particular place of work. So I thought I would just conclude um, this section by addressing some questions, um, in fact, four questions, which have been submitted by some of our listeners uh, in advance of this recording. And the first question has come in from Ghidra, and her question is, for directors who have been furloughed, what specific activities are permissible and what activities are prohibited under the CJRS? That's a really, really good question, this one. Um, and to be honest, this is a little bit of a grey area and the guidance isn't completely clear on what the position is. But the position that we do know is as follows, is that office holders and salaried company directors paid via PAYE can be furloughed and can still fill the, the statutory obligations they owe, providing two criteria are met. The first one is they do no more than would reasonably be judged necessary and the second is they are not working to generate commercial revenue or provide services to or on behalf of their company now i appreciate that um you know this is this is quite vague and and there's plenty of ambiguity here and all that I would say is in relation to this is that I know that it isn't completely crystal clear, but if there was going to be a challenge by HMRC later down the line, and I should highlight that HMRC has a statutory power to investigate claims under the CJRS for uh, you know for a five-year period, um, I would suggest that the balance and judgment at this particular time, given the ambiguity, as to what can and can't be done is with the director. So uh, take from that what you will. 
And the second question uh, is from Geetus. Now, Geetus asks, if your employer has to let you go because of the unfolding COVID-19 situation, do severance packages apply? And can employers apply some sort of force majeure other than bankruptcy and not pay out severance? Now, what I'd say in relation to this particular question is that ordinary employment principles apply in relation to the termination of employment. COVID-19 has not amended that position at all. So what this means is, is that employees, if they are going to be terminated, should be provided with at least the notice of termination in accordance with their employment contract. And if there is no written contract itself, then this would be you know, the statutory minimum notice period, which is one week per year of service. Um, and in addition to this, if there is a redundancy situation, um, which I've got to say is extremely com- common at this present time, individuals with over two years service are also in entitled to statutory redundancy repayment, which is calculated based on age, length of service and weekly income. And this is in addition to any to, to having notice of that termination itself. The third question is coming from Victoria. Um, and Victoria has informed us that two consultancy have advised completely different on the payment situation to employees. Um, A, people on furlough must be paid by the company first and only then the company will be able to claim claim grant money back. Or B, people on furlough can only be paid after the grants from government are received. Now, in relation to this question, uh, Victoria, what I would say is I'd reiterate my, my previous answer. The ordinary principles of employment law remains. An employer is contractually obliged to pay an employee in accordance with the contract of employment, obviously subject to any agreed variation to the contrary. And this will relate to salary and pay date as well. So the answer is absolutely A, the answer is absolutely A, Um, the employer will still be contractually obliged to pay the employee out regardless of of whether or not they are um, recovered and whether or not they can recover a grant under the CJRS scheme itself. And the fourth and final question um, has come in anonymously. And it reads, as many businesses will not open their offices until the end of the year at the earliest, is there a right for employees to work from home in Lithuania? And are there any any tax consequences in relation to the same. Now, in response to this question, um, I won't profess to be a tax expert and I can't comment um, you know, on the implications of working abroad from a tax perspective, but I would reiterate my advice uh, previously um, around essential travel. The UK's government's but the UK government's position um, is still that employees should work from home wherever possible, but there is no legal right per se to work from home there is a legal right to uh to, to you know to, to to request to work flexibly and to raise a flexible working request uh, subject to certain eligibility criteria um, and employers are required to deal with such requests in a reasonable manner um, from my experience agile and flexible working arrangements are becoming more and more common by the week um, so if you do have any particular issues in relation to where you are working what i'd suggest you do is that you you, you address the concern directly with your employer Um, and ask the question, um, perhaps through the means of a formal, flexible working request. So, um, yeah, that's the end of the questioning. And that concludes the employment section of this update session. Um, I hope you found the content useful. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, please feel to feel free to, to add me on, uh, on LinkedIn or send me a message. Uh, I think my details can be found on the slides accompanying this recording also. Um, and it's been my pleasure to speak with you. Cheers. Greetings all. I am Diana Suzio, a legal director, Notary Public, in the corporate and commercial team of the International Office of Hilda Concern in London. I'll be talking to you today about the asset finance aspect and the various lending issues arising as a result of COVID-19 and the impact that it has um, from a borrower's perspective with the business hats in mind. Um, This will be predominantly split into three areas. The first one dealing with the facility agreement as the main um, document regulating the relationship between the borrower and the lender. Secondly, a question that we have received in relation to the material adverse change clauses. And thirdly, in relation to a further question that we also have received 
with regard to a personal mortgage and what that means for the borrowers in the residential market. Starting with the facility um, agreement first, there are always a wide variety of clauses that impose several obligations on the borrowers. These obligations vary from the provision of information, turning into a form of representations as to the business and the operations of the borrower, the warranties as to the capacity of the borrowers and the collateral guarantors, undertakings in taking um, certain actions as well as the covenants such as maintaining financial performance up to a certain level. These run from the date of the signing of the agreement and sometimes are repeated on the date of each drawdown or on the date of the repayments or the interest payments under the loan agreement. Some of these um, obligations are negotiable, however the majority of them are no negotiable and at certain times they're also deal breakers for the lenders when um, negotiating the documentation with the borrowers. In the context of the current circumstances of COVID-19, there is inevitably a worry for the borrower's long-term viability of business trading, the capability that the borrower has to meet its obligations when they fall due, their general cash flow and their ability to keep the business afloat to ride through the difficult tide of COVID-19. It is advisable, therefore, from the outset, before we go any further in this podcast, that this is probably one of those very few situations that, despite the economic effect and the um, general negative um, impact in the market for the borrower's business, which has put them on the back foot, the borrower actually needs to be on the front foot in addressing the financial and operational issues that is currently facing in opening a dialogue with the lender as early as possible. This will avoid, surely, any unpleasant circumstances which could accelerate very quickly um, in an aggressive enforcement and ultimately could end up in a liquidation or winding up of the entire operations of the borrowers, which is, of course, a very undesirable outcome for both parties concerned. The advice, therefore, is to strongly revisit the facility agreement and the security documents to ensure that the borrower does not fall foul of any obligatory notifications inadvertently and cause an event of default under any of the documentations that he has entered into with the lender. It is also advisable that in the case of any notifications being issued to the lender, the borrower should, within such notifications, formally request the lender to provide a waiver of any event of default or potential event of default, because without such formal waiver being requested by the borrower and provided to the borrower by the lender, the lender will always reserve its rights under the documentation and may commence proceedings at any time without the borrower being aware. Question then arises, what are the risks for the borrower in such a situation? Well, This could be one of those very few situations where there may be a further drawdown which the borrower could be entitled to and would massively help the borrower from a cash flow perspective to continue running his business and operate his trade. However, the lenders in the current circumstances might not be so amenable to depart with the cash that quickly or quicker than they normally would and the borrower would find itself in a very difficult strapped for cash situation. Secondly, the risk is of course the biggest of them all is the enforcement of the security by the lender and other creditors for that matter coming forward which could potentially put the borrower in a very unpleasant circumstance and very difficult possession but position financially and ultimately leading to a winding up or liquidation proceedings. These are not easy steps to be taken and would come at hefty costs to the lender and other secured creditors or unsecured creditors. They would usually take some time to finalise. However, the borrower will have to face the situation of challenging or defending such actions which would cost the lender, of course financially and legally, um, not taking into account the additional stress 
and the pressure they would put on the business and the operations generally. The other risk, of course, um, is that the borrowers or any collateral guarantors could have potentially entered into guarantees. And these, when we refer to guarantees, do not only include corporate guarantees, but also personal guarantees, which may have been issued by um, any shareholder or a corporate parent guarantor, or even the directors being asked at the time to put forward such personal guarantees in favour of the lender. The lenders would absolutely consider taking actions under the various guarantees as the more cheaper and quicker and cost-effective option um, as opposed to um, having to realise their security and their losses under any asset security package which might not be that easily accessible to the lender or in a jurisdiction where with the current um, restrictions in place, such legal actions might not be immediately available to the lender. It is therefore very important that um, any borrower that does have any of these guarantees in place to open the discussions with the lender as soon as possible to avoid any such actions being taken against them personally. The next risk, which is initially forgotten, so to speak, and it only becomes apparent when the lender is in fact proactive in relation to notifying and bringing this to the borrower's attention, is where the loan-to-value ratio, or other known as the LTV, goes down as a result of any economic downturn or recession under the domino effect of COVID-19 effect in the country where the borrower is trading or the security assets are based. This goes back, again, to the general undertakings and representation and warranties and covenants referred to earlier in the podcast, which the borrower has provided to the lender and procured that any collateral guarantors have provided to the lender at the time of entry into the facility agreement. What we have noticed from our experience in these instances is that several borrowers are revaluing their current packages and in an attempt to restructure the loan with the lender, they are being asked to put up additional security, which is free of encumbrance at the time in favour. I'd like to expand further a little bit on the force majeure clause, which Rosie mentioned earlier in the introduction, in the context of the facility agreement. A good force majeure clause, which um, has been included in a facility agreement, would generally provide for the following... Um, Firstly, it will list the events which shall constitute a force majeure. Secondly, it will describe the process of the notification of the party relying on the force majeure towards the other party. And thirdly, it will also provide for the consequences of that force majeure clause as to what effects it has once uh, the notification has been served. A force majeure clause can be utilised by both the borrower and the lender, actually, in a facility agreement. In the context of a borrower, that would be served with the premise that the borrower is prevented to perform his obligations under the facility agreement as the result of the effect of the force majeure event having occurred. And equally, the lender could be prevented from making the facility available to the borrower under the terms of the force majeure clause because it may be unable to do so internally, for example, from a logistical perspective or policies or restrictions being put in place as a result of the force majeure event. In the context of COVID-19, borrowers would rely on this clause on the basis of a pandemic if expressly provided so within the drafting of the force majeure clause or alternatively on the basis of a government act or government authorizations or guidance. And this is usually the second most preferred form of wording in a force majeure clause. It is essential to explain how a government act works. This would relate to the response by the various governments around the world to the pandemic being declared by the World Health Organization, which has resulted in several restrictions or otherwise in common terms known as the lockdown in economies and businesses. It is important to, however, draw a distinction here. Whilst the restrictions may provide for financial and operation difficulties for the borrowers in the short term, 
The reliance upon such government restrictions constituting a force majeure need to be an event outside of the party's control, in this case the borrower for example, and the party must show that it has taken steps to mitigate the effect of the force majeure event. I believe it is too early for any lenders or um, any other contractual parties to be taking any enforcement actions immediately um, upon being served with a force majeure um, event notification under the terms of the facility agreement, um, as this is usually only a protection measure to allow the party which is serving the force majeure clause notification to stop the time, so to speak, under the contract. Um, it is in no party's interest to actually terminate the contract, which is one of the effects or of a notification being served and received um, in reliance of the force majeure event clause. Dealing with the question on the material adverse change clause um, received, this is actually a very interesting question and the reality is that each facility agreement, commercial contract, security document contract or guarantee will have its own definition and its own spectrum as to what constitutes a material adverse change for the parties in the relevant document. However, the most commonly acceptable principle as to what should constitute a material adverse change event are broken down as follows. Material. This needs to be something significant, a circumstance or event that has a direct impact on the business, on the operations, on the financial standing of the borrower and or the collateral guarantors. Adverse. This means that it needs to have an immediate negative impact. As mentioned earlier, this is not an adverse effect which has happened in the past or is reoccurring, but it must be a negative impact as a result of the event that has happened only at the time of the event, in this instance the outbreak of COVID-19, and it is of a temporary nature, therefore not persisting for long and not usual for the modus operandi of the borrower or the borrower's group. What constitutes a temporary period, of course, is a question of facts. In the current circumstances, um, temporary period could have it or has already been around three months and it could be a six month period or a nine month period. A change needs to be an event or a circumstance which the borrower did not or could not have control over, such as for example the outbreak of the pandemic. Depending upon how the clause has been negotiated, the borrower may have a grace period to rectify this material adverse change. Sometimes the borrowers are granted a grace period, particularly when these events or circumstances are under their control. However, as mentioned, a MAC clause is usually a temporary period and for an event outside of the borrower's control. And therefore, the grace period already provided for within the facility agreement or the security documents could be insufficient or even not available. And a formal waiver, again, will be needed from the lender to such material adverse change having occurred. It is worth noting that the lenders do not generally prefer to serve a notice on an event of default and call upon the security solely relying on the basis of a MAC having occurred. Lenders like an aggregate a series of events and a aggregate grounds upon which they would enforce their security, a MAC clause being one of them. What are the solutions in the circumstances? Well, even though it might be like an um, impossible situation for a large number of borrowers um, who perhaps may have um, encountered difficulties preceding the outbreak of the pandemic, there are certainly various actions available to the borrower. I have already run through some of those in the presentation, however, I'd like to summarise these again. Firstly, as mentioned, it is of paramount importance to have an open discussion with the financiers as early as possible. It is important that the lenders are made aware of any issues and difficulties the borrowers are having right from the outset to enable a open dialogue, honest dialogue as to how best address the situation without going to the drastic measures of security enforcement 
and or ultimately liquidation or winding up of the borrower's business. Secondly, the borrower needs to look at his insurance. The majority of the insurances that the borrower would have taken would have been a sign in favour of the lender. Is COVID-19 um, as part of the pandemics or diseases provided in such insurance documents? If the answer is yes, then the insurances are assigned to the lender. Then the borrower could have a possibility of claiming some of these and allow itself some breathing space. Thirdly, um, the borrower could look for additional source of funding to assist with short-term cash accessibility. This may come with a high price in terms of the interest rates or any arrangement fees. However, the existing lenders may consent to the borrower obtaining such short-term additional debt in order to assist the borrower to get through the difficult temporary period. It is worth noting that lenders generally will do this for good operators who could or had no possibility of foreseeing the difficult circumstances under their which as a result of the um, outbreak of COVID-19. Finally, the borrower could explore a government scheme for loans available um, to the businesses affected by uh, coronavirus, other now, otherwise known as um, CCBILS, Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. And the borrower may need to look further afield um, in the sense of no not looking just at the lender um, and the jurisdiction where the borrower is incorporated, but also in several other jurisdictions where the borrower could be operating his trade business or where the assets are based. Some of these uh, government um, loans do come with various leniency or favourable interest rates and the borrowers therefore need to be proactive in securing these as early as possible and within the relevant timelines. Dealing with the final question with relation to the personal mortgages, the above principles of security, open dialogue and reviewing any obligations under the facility agreement and the mortgage deeds also apply in the same context for any borrowers in the residential market. If the borrower is finding himself in a difficult position and after assessing all of the finances and what is available to him otherwise, they could be in a position where they are unable to make the payment and they could try to renegotiate the terms of the loan agreement with the lender by either extending the term, which would then reduce the um, monthly repayment on a capital interest, or change the repayment of the loan, for example, to interest only, or negotiate a further or a longer holiday repayment period in addition to the current one already advised by the government on the repayment of the mortgage. I hope that you have found the above um, presentation helpful and I appreciate that it's probably slightly longer than, than anticipated. However, being such a delicate topic that affects the majority of us, I felt that it was important for me to cover areas in as much detail as possible in order to give an informative podcast. If you have any further queries or would like our assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out to me using the contact details on the slide accompanying this podcast presentation and also to any of my colleagues covering the other important areas. Thank you for listening. Please stay safe and well.